Come on, everybody say, not a fan. Everybody, okay, now if you haven't been here for the last few weeks, let me bring you up to speed. We are talking about the difference between fans and followers of Christ, all right? So everybody say, I'm not a fan, I'm a follower. That's the whole goal. Our whole goal is to move you from a fan to a follower. You know, statistically, they say that America has uh, 95% of everybody they ask, you know, 95% of the people uh, uh, polled say they are Christians. 95%. 95%. How many of you know if that was really, really true and people were, in 95 out of every 100 people in America were really Christians, not fans? But they were real Christians, they were followers. How many of you know that we'd be in a whole different place? We'd be in a whole different place, absolutely, absolutely. Everything would be different if people were actually followers instead of fans. So the, this, uh, this week, I almost said this morning, y'all pray for me, I'm still getting adjusted. But, uh, but uh, this, this evening, I thought I would really bring you a message that was on my heart, and I'll be honest with you, we as far as staff and as far as the team here at, at, at the church this week, we've all just battled through some things, whether it's logistically, whether it's this or that or the other, to get this message to you. So I am confident this message is going to change something, something in your heart tonight. If it isn't, please don't tell me because we're convinced it is. All right? We are convinced it is. But in light of that, we talked about a fan. A fan of Christ is someone who, get this, it is someone who simply, and it, anybody remember the definition I gave you? Huh? An enthusiastic admirer. Everybody say enthusiastic admirer. Is someone that's just enthusiastic about admiring Jesus, but they're not really following. And then we said that, that the difference between that and a follower, a follower is someone who imitates Christ. I mean, you know, you've been saved, born again. If you have been saved, born again here the, tonight, then guess what? God has called you not just to be an admirer of Jesus, but rather to actually imitate Jesus. I got one person. And it's Deb on Amen Row. She's going to amen everything I say. I can, I can say anything. She'll amen it, all right? <laughs> all right. I mean, no, seriously. How many of you know there is a difference? There is a difference between someone, between someone who's just admiring forgiveness and practicing forgiveness. Someone who's admiring long-suffering, and I'll give you plenty of examples last week, uh, and, and doing long-suffering. They're, 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 I admire peace. But do you experience peace? See, that's the difference. We want you to experience what God has for you. So in light of that, I, I have this message here tonight, and, and I've, I've struggled with the title, and, and I don't know whether I should call it Stuck in the Mud, or if I should say Take Off the Bag. How many of you know nobody likes a bag? Some of you don't even know where this is going. You're like, I don't know. Well, I got some pictures for you. I love creating tension in the room. I love creating it because it's so funny. How about this? How about this? How many of you like this bag? Waiting for next year again. Anybody see that? Huh? How about this? Maybe you guys know what this bag is. Forever that ain't. If you're from South Louisiana, you know that is what the saints have been about forever. Y'all hear what I'm saying? How about this one? Some of you, some of you need to see, see this next one here. Uh, let's see here. Photo number three. Look at this. <laughs> oh, and 16. Oh, and 16. How about this one? Oh, that doesn't belong up there. Hold up, hold up. I'm just kidding. <laughs> How did that get there? How did that get there? I, my bad. My bad. <laughs> was that really what I thought it was? Yeah, it is. It is. That's the best thing I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> no, how about this? How about these guys right here? 107 years. Any Cub fans? Hold on, I got something for you. <laughs> you need a bag. You need, if you're a Cub fan, hundred. I mean, I would think after 107 years... I mean, it would have got, like the other team would have all got sick and nobody would have showed up. 
If you don't know anything about the Cubs, they haven't won a World Series in 107 years. But nevertheless, I digress to say this, to say this, that we all have times, get this, where we're solid fans. And I talked about that last week, how we're solid fans. But I believe that we have a lot of times where we have brown bag moments. Brown bag moments. Brown bag moments. And simply, uh, to, to kind of say it this way, Whenever you see fans wearing bags over their heads, they're usually the most passionate, most on fire. I mean, y'all know what I'm talking about? You know what I'm saying? They are the people that they are just on fire for that team. And they are so irritated that the team is failing them that they put a bag over their head. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you haven't seen some bad teams. But listen, they put a bag over their head. And, and I believe that in the Bible, there is an example of someone who had a brown bag moment. And, and here's my heart for you tonight. I want to challenge you that if you have a brown bag moment, listen, it's time to take the bag off, man. Nobody likes a bag. Go ahead, touch your wife. It's the only time on Valentine's Day you can say, don't be a bag, all right? So just touch and say, don't. <laughs> Everybody's all right still. Everybody's all right. Hey, listen, it's all right. Don't be a bag. We don't want anybody to be, to be a bag. But let me, let's just check this out from a dude in the Bible that you can understand and kind of go with. Look at this whenever we talk about this. Check this out. Look at uh, Matthew chapter, or I'm sorry, Luke chapter 5, verse Four. We're going to talk about these guys, the disciples, and how it went down with them. Check this out. Uh, Luke 5, verse 4. And when he had stopped speaking, Jesus, he said to him, Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets, nets for a catch. This is the beginning of Jesus' ministry. He's about to call the disciples to come and follow him. In the process of that, listen to what he tells them. He says, hey, listen, go out into the deep, launch out, lay down your nets, and come and follow me. Is, is the context. But look at verse 5. But when Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down our nets. How many of you know that's one of the most powerful things you can do? Can do? Just obey Jesus for his word. Just do what he asks. Do what he asks. Even if you don't understand it. How many of you know there's a lot of times, if you're going to be a fully devoted follower of Christ, God's going to ask you to do some things you don't really understand sometimes. Yeah, yeah, a lot of times. Look at this, verse 6. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish, and their nets were breaking, verse 7. So they signaled to their partners in the other boats to come and to help them, and they came and they filled both the boats, so they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, check this out, he fell on his knees saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O oh, what? O oh, Lord. Listen, uh, people that are, well, a lot of times we don't think it's the goodness of God that draws men to repentance. God here, if you read the Bible here, Jesus didn't say anything about his sin. Jesus just blessed him with a whole load of fish. And that blessing in his heart came alive and he said, my goodness, I got to get right with God i got to be right with God. And that's a powerful thing whenever you understand the Bible right. You'll understand that the more God shows you how good he is, the more you just want to live for God. It's the opposite of religion. Religion says you dirtbag, you worm. you got to do it through self-effort to live right for God. The Bible teaches us that, man, when we see how good he is, we can't help but live right for him. How about this? It's Valentine's. I'll say it this way. When you fall in love with your spouse, you should fall out of love with other folk. Isn't that the way it happens? Isn't that the way it's supposed to happen? <sighs> Verse 9, And for he and all those who were with him were astonished at the catch of the fish and they, that they had taken in. Verse 10, And so they also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you shall catch men. Look at verse 11. This is where I'm going. Look at this. So when they had brought their boats to the land, they forsook all and what? Followed him. They did what? They forsook all and followed him. In this series, we're talking about fan versus followers. Fans of Christ don't give anything. They just observe. 
Followers forsake all to follow him. Y'all hear what I'm saying? We forsake all to follow him. These disciples, here they are. you got to understand what they were giving up. They were giving up their livelihood. They were giving up, honestly, they were giving up their heritage. Most people were trained and taught by their fathers on how to make a living back in that day. They didn't restart a different occupation every generation like we do now. They, they kept with the same generationally program that they did. So Peter was probably taught by his father, who was taught by his father, who was taught by his father. Generally, generationally, it was passed down. So whenever they said, you know, they were leaving all, I want you to understand what they were leaving. They were leaving all. They, they weren't just leaving their job. They were leaving their heritage. They were leaving their way of income. They were leaving everything that they possessed to follow this dude that showed up that they picked up on the idea he might be the Messiah. How many of you know that's some radical faith right there? Some radical faith. Let somebody show up at the water with me while I'm fishing and say, come and follow me. I say, I'm busy. I'm fishing. I'll be back later. Not these guys, man. They left all forsook it, forsake it, however you say it, and they went after Jesus. And I'm telling you, that is the safest place for you to be, following Jesus, forsaking all, and following Jesus. How many of you would agree with that? Now, out of that crowd, there was one dude that specifically, I want to key on the rest of my message here, is there's one dude that specifically stood out beyond all the other dudes. I mean, this was like, you know, this dude was ate up with being a disciple. I mean, he was all about it. He was sold out. He was committed. He had probably, I can share some of his disease. He had a disease. He had a disease that was a sickness. It's not mentioned in the Bible, but I believe he did have a disease. It was, uh, it's called foot and mouth disease. You may have heard of it every once in a while. Sometimes I get it. It comes by, swings by, stops by, and then I, I got to go on. But, but this man... Had a foot mouth disease, always putting his foot in his mouth. I mean, this dude right here, whenever Jesus would say things, he was the only dude that would stand up and rebuke Jesus. Y'all hear what? You, you, you guys get that? I mean, he's rebuking Jehovah. He's telling God what's up. How many of you know you ain't telling God what's up? But, but this one dude, you might know who I'm talking about. Come on, it's got to be Peter. Peter's the only dude that had it in him to stand up to Jesus. The Bible tells us actually one time him and Jesus got into a spat and he manhandled Jesus. Could you imagine that? I mean, Jesus could call down angels. Big, bad, burly, beat your mama down angels. <laughs> but Peter, and listen, if you don't know anything about fishermen, this was a this was the, 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 I mean, anybody ever heard the term cuss like a sailor? That started with the disciples, y'all. I mean, people that fished back in that day were burly, mean. It, it was a tough living. It was a hard living. I mean, I mean, these were men among men. Y'all getting what I'm saying? And they were forsaking all to follow Jesus. And the one dude out of that crowd that stood out as as more than anybody, was Peter. And Peter stood up, and listen, he was all in. He was all in. And I would expect that most of us would say we're all in. I mean, Peter said he was all in. And let me just show you a couple things that he said about him being all in whenever it came to him actually vocalize it. Look at Matthew chapter 26, verse 35. He said something like this. He said, Peter said to them, Even if I have to die with you, Lord... Even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And he so said all, and so said all the disciples. Peter was the, was the dude that said, hey, listen, Jesus, if you're going to die, I'm going to die with you, man. I'm all in. I'm all in. I'm all about you. I'm not a brown bag follower. I'm not going to put my head in the sand and ignore you. No, 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 man. I'm all in, Jesus. I'm all in. And then you look at another statement. Check this one out. In John 18, 10, look at this. And Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest servant and cut off his right ear, and the servant's name was Malchus. Now get this. This is right before Jesus is about to be arrested. Right before Jesus is about to be arrested, here comes the soldiers. And now Peter 
stands up and he thinks it's like a mafia get together. Y'all hear what I'm saying? He pulls out a sword and whacks homeboy's ear off. How many of you know that's somebody sold out for Jesus? How many of you know? I'm just trying to prove my point. Homeboy is all in. He is all in. He is all about Jesus. He is sold out to the max. Now, y'all know probably where I'm going with this story. But check this out. He sold out completely. Then something happens. What happens? What happens next? If you don't know Bible very much, let me explain. After Peter chops off the ears, they cut, uh, uh, Jesus grabs the ear, which would have been wild. Jesus grabs the ear off the ground. I don't know if he blew on it, washed it. Probably not. And he took his ear up, stuck it on side of a homeboy's head. His name wasn't homeboy. And, and put it on the side of his head and healed his ear. Now, if you were that soldier, at that point, would you stop? Man, I know I would. But, but, but nevertheless, they come and they take and they arrest Jesus. Now watch. Here's this guy that's completely sold out to Jesus, completely bought in. He's following Jesus. You remember what he said? I'm going to follow you till death. I'm gonna, I, there ain't no way I'm turning. Ain't no way. No way. Everybody else can leave you, but I'm not forsaking you. You know? When Jesus said, I'm going to go to the cross, he says, you will not. Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. You're an offense to me. You don't know the purpose and the plan of God. Peter, man, sold out. Sold out completely. And now, they come and they take Jesus away. Now this man among men I mean, now becomes something very, very different. Very different. Look at it right here in the text. I'll give it to you. Whenever you read it here, uh, check this out. Luke chapter 22, verse 54. Having arrested him, and they led him, talking about Jesus, having uh, they led him, they brought him into the high priest's house. But Peter followed from, or I'm sorry, at a what? At a distance. Man, you know it's all going south then. See, check this out. It's easy to root for your team when you're winning. Come on, somebody. It's easy to root for your team. It's easy to follow your team. It's easy. It's easy. It's easy to root for your team. But when your team begins to lose, I don't even know, it becomes a little bit harder to root for your team. It becomes a little bit harder to fight for your team. It becomes a little bit harder for you to stick close to your team. And you guys understand the parallel that I'm drawing, right? You understand that I'm not talking about a team per se. I'm talking about Jesus. I'm talking about it's easy to follow Jesus when everything's going good and everything is easy. And when it looks like victory is just almost at your door. But how many of you know those are not the times when your faith is tested the most? The time when your faith is tested the most is when everything looks like it's falling around, falling down around you, when it's all crumbling to the ground, when your life is falling apart, your marriage is falling apart, your finances are falling apart, your life's falling apart, things begin to crumble and fall. And you begin to look around and you go, oh, 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 whoa, whoa, I thought Jesus was in the midst of this. I, I, I thought, and what, uh, what happens to us oftentimes is we begin to distance ourselves from Jesus. We begin to separate ourselves just for a little bit, thinking, well, maybe this ain't all working. Maybe this ain't what it's cracked up to be. Maybe God isn't even real. Maybe God doesn't even belong in this picture. Maybe I've got this all messed up. Hey, check this out. I believe there are two times when people become brown bag fans of Jesus. You ready? I'll give it to you. If you're taking notes, you can write this down. But check this out. I believe there are two specific, time, uh, specific times whenever people wear the brown bag. Check this out. When they see God as failed or when they feel they failed God. I'm telling you right here. These two things right here will cause you to wear a brown bag. These two things right here will cause you to put on the bag of shame and not commit your life to Christ and cause you to back up. I've just wanted to do this because I worked so hard on this bag. 
Actually, I said, Michelle, will you, will you? I'm, I was pointing at my eyes today, and I, I, I pointed in the back. I said, here are my eyes. She goes, your eyes are crooked. <laughs> I said, it's the bag. It's the bag. <laughs> anyway, all right. But, but on a serious note, there are two times, I believe specifically, when we put on the bag of shame, man. We put on the bag of shame, number one, when we believe this, we fail God. And number two, when God fails us. Hey, check this out. Peter had to be thinking, listen, this is not a spiritual giant. Peter is not a spiritual giant. Y'all don't believe me, I can tell. Uh, Check this out. Just to prove my point, uh, that he is not a spiritual giant. Look at uh, Luke chapter 22. Verse 60. Most of you know the story, but some things I want to point out about it. But Peter said that uh, this was after Jesus was uh, being taken away to be crucified. Check this out. But Peter said to the man, you remember they asked, do you know him? Here's what Peter said. Man, I love that. He talks like us. (laughs) Man, I don't even know what you're saying. Immediately, while he was still speaking, the uh, the rooster crowed. Watch this. And the Lord turned to Peter. Why did Peter say, I don't even know him? Why did Peter say that? I believe there's a couple things. Well, in another text, you'll find out that where I was going with that was, you'll find out that whenever they came and they asked Peter, Peter, do you know him? One of the times it says, the text says, and he cursed at them. He started cussing them out. I don't know what that sounded like then, but it, he was cussing them out. He was mad. He's upset. I don't know him. I don't know him. He's denying the whole thing. He's denying he even, know, he even knows him. And now we find here that the Lord turned to Peter and looked at Peter. You know, I believe that Peter probably was thinking this. Man, I left everything I had. I I, I left it all back there three and a half years ago. I left it there on the side of the water. I left it all. And then now he promised that he was going to come and restore a kingdom. He was going to give us power and authority. We were going to tread upon serpents and scorpions over all the power of the enemy. I've seen the deaf ears open, blind eyes open. I thought he was going to restore Israel, and now they come and get him, and he's not even fighting. I mean, what is wrong with this picture? Yeah, I'm not a part of that club. Y'all hear what I'm saying? How many of you know, how many of you know, though, he was stopping way short of where it was all going? But Peter, I believe, is just like any of us. He had a brown bag moment, man. He said, you know what? I just mm, I just don't know if I can get with this. I don't know if I can get with this. And what he was really thinking was this right here. He was thinking this right here. God's failing us. God is failing us. God is failing us. When you believe God is failing you, how many of you know the first thing you give up is your faith? Because faith is believing he is And he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And without faith, the Bible says, it is impossible to please God. Do y'all hear that? So it's impossible to please God without faith. And then the number one thing that happens whenever you believe God fails you is you give your faith up. And I believe Peter was battling with this. He was feeling like God had failed them. And now watch this. When Jesus looked over at Peter, I believe the opposite occurred, the top one. I believe he felt like I failed God. I failed Jesus. Here I was. I was a disciple. I walked with him for three and a half years. I know who this dude is. I know what he said. I believe what he said. I've been walking with him all this time. And now, when he really, really needs me, I'm failing him. I'm failing him. Anybody ever failed God before? Okay, me. Raise your hand if you believe you've ever failed God. All right, we got some that are raising their hand. If you didn't raise your hand, raise your hand. How many of you just ain't participating no matter what? Raise your hand. No, no. No, hey, listen, I'm going to tell you one story just real quick. There was a time back, uh, uh, we'll go back, it was uh, 2010, I believe it was, whenever, and I'll be honest with you, this was probably the biggest blunder of my spiritual walk with Christ. And it really, honestly, from the outside looking in, it really wasn't that big of a deal. It wasn't that big of a deal. But man, I remember there was a specific time where God told me not to do something. Not to do something. 
And you know what I did? Come on, I did it anyway. I did it anyway. I did it anyway. Because I thought, you know what? Here's the deal. I'm going to do what I want to do. Because I believe I know better than God. Yeah? And when I did that, I remember, you can ask Michelle, we were sitting, the kids, we were all sitting there. I remember where we were, on, on the Sycamore Road at the Taco Bell. The Taco Bell out on Sycamore Road. And I am not a crier. I don't typically cry, except for The Notebook. I hate that movie. But <laughs> anyway, and she set that one up too. How many of you heard about The Notebook? Hey, listen, dudes, don't ever watch it. <laughs> Michelle turned that on one night. We watched about two hours of it. I don't know. It seemed like 14 hours long. But we watched a couple hours of it, and it was about 20 minutes before it was over. Michelle goes, I think I'll go to bed now. And I'm thinking, well, how can you go to bed? The movie's not over. I mean, you know, it was right before they started getting real, real in the ditch. Yeah, about 20 minutes later, <laughs> it was bad, it was bad, it was, it was a wreck. I'm not a crier, okay, but, but anyway, and here I say that. Okay, so check this out. So we're sitting at Taco Bell, and honestly, I remember the kids asking me, and they was like, Dad, what, what's wrong? What's your problem? What's going on? And man, I just busted. I started crying. And they're like, what is wrong? And I said, and I told them, I said, I feel like I miss God. I totally miss God. And it wasn't that, get this, it's one thing if you miss God by accident. Like you're following after God and you make a wrong step. Come on, Eric, we've all done that. And God gets you on the road. It's another when you make a volitional decision to purposely disobey. <laughs> and I believe this, and listen, and I started crying. I started crying. I didn't even know how else to do it. I can so identify with Peter, and let me tell you what it made me want to do. It made me not want to run to God. It made me want to put a bag over my head. That's what it made me want to do. It made me want to hide myself. I, I wanted to hide. Now, I was a pastor at this time. It had nothing to do with the church, by the way. So those of you that may have heard rumors. <laughs> All right? Uh, it made me want to hide. It, I, I felt like I had blown it. I felt like, my goodness, what a knucklehead. What was I thinking? Why did I do that? Why did I purposely disobey? And I, man, I can so identify with Peter. Check this out. Look at that verse that we were just looking at. Here's what he said, uh, verse 60, uh, or uh, Luke 22, verse 60. It says, but Peter, man, I don't know what you're saying. Immediately while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed, and the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Then Peter remembered what the word of the Lord was and how he had said to him, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Now look at this, verse 20 or 62. And so Peter went out and he wept bitterly. Wept bitterly. Let me tell you, he had been broken on the inside. He felt completely broken. He felt like I would rather hide my face then talk to Jesus. If you're here today, and man, you feel like you've missed it some, at some point in your life, which we all have, man, I'm just here to tell you, don't put a bag over your head. Don't be ashamed. Don't be ashamed of it. We've all missed it at some point in time. And it's okay, and it's absolutely natural. Absolutely natural. Absolutely natural. Think about what, think about what Peter did. Think about what Peter did. Peter went from this, all right? Peter went from this, he went from a fan, or I'm sorry, from a, from a follower to a fan, remember, traveling at a distance watching Jesus, to a complete forsaker of Jesus. Do you know that, and, and a lot of times people don't talk about this, how many of you know there was another dude who forsook Jesus? Who's that? Come on, talk to me, anybody know? Come on, he did it for 30 pieces of silver? Come on, Judas. How many of you know there's a difference because one was money, one was not? I mean, at least Judas got some money out of it. Hello? At least he got paid for it. Peter didn't. Peter didn't. My, and, and I'm not trying to say we should all imitate Judas. Okay? Lest you get the theology wrong. No. What I'm trying to say is that what Peter and Judas did wasn't so far different from each other. 
They both, they both kind of turned their back on Jesus. But look at the difference between Peter and Judas and how it all turned out. Judas ended up hanging himself. Why? He put a bag over his head and he hid from God. He felt so bad about what he did, he never could be restored. Absolutely. Listen, sometimes when we fail, we think we got to hide from God. And I'm here to tell you, don't ever hide from God. Don't ever hide from God. That's the very time that you got to realize you need to get right with God. Listen to this. Check this out. Let me show you something about God that is absolutely awesome. I preached this whole message to show you just this part. All right? And I could have said it in two minutes, but I didn't want to. All right, I'm just kidding. Listen to this. Listen to this. Look at this verse here. I, I want to show you something here. I want to show you something here. I'm going to show you two verses back to back, and then I'm going to explain. Look at this. This is Luke chapter 24, verse 34, saying, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Who is Simon? Come on, everybody say Peter. Peter. All right, now check this out. Not only that verse, but look at this one, 1 Corinthians 15, 5. And that he has been seen by Cephas, which is Peter, and then by the who? By the 12. Now, now I'll give you one more verse, and then I'm going I'm to bring it together, this part of it. Look at this. Uh, look at one more verse here, if you up on the screen here. Um, Mark 16, 7. But go, this is what Jesus, but go and tell the disciples and Peter that he is going before you into Galilee. You will see him there as he had said to you. Now everybody look at me and check this out. I ran across this this week and it really blessed me in light of what I'm trying to say. Get this. The first two verses I gave you are verses that people don't really read too often. But they're two verses that say, that say Jesus met with Peter. Let me give you kind of chronologically what happened. Jesus dies. Three days, three nights go by. Mary, uh, Mary comes to the tomb, sees that the tomb is empty, runs off. All right? Runs off. Somewhere between there and in the evening, all right, something happens where Peter encounters Jesus. It's mentioned twice in the Bible. It's the only place, in, it's the only person that the Bible says that Jesus met with by himself before he met with the disciples. Before. Somewhere during the resurrection day, Jesus encountered Peter by himself. Say, so why, why is that? It's the only person. It's the only person that says that he met by himself. Every time, every other time, it was where a multitude or whatever, but it's the only place. It's the only place. I think it's so powerful that Jesus met with Peter by himself long before he met with the disciples and everybody else. You say, Pastor Charlie, what's that got to do with anything? Let me tell you what it has. It has everything to do with everything. How many of you know, how many of you know what Peter was going through? How many of you bet those three days and three nights were the longest three days and three nights of his life? Feeling completely fors like he had forsaken Jesus and totally turned his back on Jesus. And I bet you, I bet you he wasn't feeling like an apostle at this point in time. And I bet you this conversation went something like this. Peter, why do you got your head down like that? This isn't in the Bible. I'm just saying this is probably how it went. Peter would look up and see the Lord. Say, Lord, it's you. It's you, and I'm so sorry. And I'm so sorry that I turned my back on you. I bet you Jesus just interrupted me. Shh, shh. It's all right. It's okay. It's okay, Peter. You need to stop. Shh. I know. It's okay. I know what you did. It's fine. I don't think the Lord showed up and beat him down. I don't think he beat him up. I don't think he, he rebuked him or anything like that. I think he showed up and said, shh, 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 I know. It's okay. It's all right. You missed it. I get it. It's all right. I'm not mad at you. I'm not irritated at you. I'm not upset at you. I'm here to restore you. I'm here to restore you. I know you love me. I know you got messed up. I know you had a situation where you failed. I know you bombed it. But I'm here to restore you. I'm not here to beat you up. I'm here to restore you. You need to hear the heart of God tonight. That God is not someone who comes along and beats you down. 
that God comes along and he restores. He's a God that restores, not a God who tears down. He restores lives. He restores marriages. He restores relationships. He restores things. He doesn't tear things down. When he showed up to Peter, he came to restore Peter. Came to restore him. And you know what? Jesus is so awesome that he doesn't even do it in front of everybody. Even though Peter denied him in front of everybody, Jesus showed up mano y mano. Hey, bro, it's all right. And restores him. Completely restores him. Because he is a restorer. If you've got areas of your life that seem crazy and chaotic, let me tell you, Jesus is a restorer. And don't hide your face because you think you failed God. I don't know of anybody in here that has spent three and a half years physically with Jesus. If you did, we need prayer for you. You, you, you probably wasn't with him. But anyway... Three and a half years physically with Jesus and then betrayed him. How many of you know that's blowing it big time? How many of you know you walked out, if you was to do that, you would feel like you had totally forsaken God and there was no hope? But Jesus came to restore the brokenhearted. He comes and he restores Peter. All by himself. We don't know the conversation exactly how it all went, but we know that Jesus met with Peter before he met with anybody else. And then you find a little bit later, let me show you the rest of the story because it gets even better. Because you know the rest of the disciples were having a fit, I'm sure. I'm sure of it. Look over here at um, John 21, verse 7. And therefore, when the disciples whom Jesus loved uh, said to Peter, it is the Lord. Now, if you don't know the context, let me explain the context of what's going on. Check this out. The disciples are in the boat. They had went back to their comfort zone of fishing. They, th they think that, you know, what else are we supposed to do? They went back to fishing. Jesus is up on the shore. He sees them, and he says, hey, have you guys caught anything? They said, we haven't caught anything all night. He says, hey, throw your nets down on the other side. So they throw their nets down on the other side, and they realize they've got more fish than they can take in. Suddenly, John... The Apostle John recognizes that's Jesus. So he says now to Peter, he says, Therefore the disciple uh, whom Jesus loved. Isn't it interesting? John always says, whom Jesus loved. Do you think he had a pride issue? <laughs> He's always saying, I'm his favorite. But anyway, therefore whom the, uh, Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. Now watch this. Watch what happens. Now, and this is after Jesus meets with Peter. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, uh, and, he, and he put it on for he had removed it. Get this. And, um, he, and plunged into the sea. I mean, you know, something happened now. He's back. He's back. He's like the comeback kid, man. He had, he had met with Jesus. Jesus had restored him. Listen, had Jesus not met with him, I bet you he would have sat in that boat and said, you know what, I failed God. There's no room for me up there. There's no way I should be going up there. But instead, no. He put, what does he do? Listen, do you remember at the first time whenever Jesus asked him to come and follow him, what did they do? They forsook all and what? Followed Jesus. Why? Because that's what followers do. They forsake all and follow Jesus. Now, Peter has gone full circle. He's had a bad season, had a bad moment. He feels like he failed God. And now guess what? Jesus is on shore. Guess what? I'm leaving this place. I'm going after Jesus. I'm going after him with all that I have. Can I assure you of this this, mor uh, this morning? Here I go again. <laughs> this evening, that the best place to be is full-blown fallen uh, fallen over to get to Jesus, just all the way after Jesus. The, think of it this way. The only time Peter wept is when he, when he was distant from God. The time when he was most fulfilled is when he was following God close. If you want to be fulfilled in your relationship with God, get real close to him, no matter where he is. And now understand this. Understand that the boat represents his comfort zone. Peter's comfortable in a boat. He's a, he's a fisherman. He understands that. But listen, Jesus was on shore. So guess where Peter was going? He was going on shore. 
He was going on shore. Now watch this. Here's how the discourse goes. You know that after Peter got there to the shore, then the disciples come rolling up in the boat. And then now we get to the place where Peter wants, or I'm sorry, Jesus wants to restore Peter in front of everybody now. See, he doesn't restore him once with their relationship. But Jesus knows he needs to restore them Restore him in front of everyone else. Because you, come on, people are people. How many of y'all know that? You remember? And I bet you the disciples were like, yeah, look at Peter jumping out of the boat. You know, he was over there singing that song, I'd catch a grenade for you. Yeah, and then Jesus had a hard time. He done bailed. Come on, people are people, y'all. Y'all don't know that song? You want me to sing it again? <laughs> No. Hey, listen. Peter was the first dude. I know, it's terrible, right? It's terrible. Peter was the first dude that took off. Hiding. And now here he is. We're in a boat. Sees Jesus. Oh, now he's sold out again because he's risen. Way to go, Peter. Come on. You guys got to be there. You got to know that the people are people. These are not spiritual giants. Peter was cussing three days earlier. Telling people he wasn't even didn't have anything to do with him. Well, I just don't think Peter cussed. Well, you need to read the Bible. <laughs> look down here a little bit at this verse here. Where were we at? 21.7? Look, look down, 21.15. Look at this conversation. So when they had eaten breakfast, and you know, you know that you know what was going on at breakfast. <laughs> yeah, look at Peter. Thinks he's all that. Over there rubbing up on Jesus. Where were you, pal, three days ago? Well, you wasn't carrying no bodies, was you? Yeah, you guys can spiritualize it if you want to. I see them as real people. Check this out. They had eaten breakfast. Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? It's an interesting play on words, and I don't want to get too in-depth into this tonight, but I will tell you that the word that Jesus used was agape, which means, do you unconditionally love me? Unconditionally. And listen to what he said. He said to him, yes, Lord, for you know I love you. When he said, I love you, he didn't say, I agape. He said, I phileo. I love you like a brother. I love you like a brother. I don't love you unconditionally. I love you like a brother. Get this. Peter had recognized his own weakness, his inability to love God with everything he has. Come on, y'all hearing what I'm saying? He had been humbled now. He had been put in his place, and he gets it. And now, so now, check this out. He's like, I love you, and I'd like to say unconditionally, but I've already learned that I conditionally love you. When things are good, I love you, but when things are bad, man, I struggle to love you. Come on. Check this out. So he said, so he said, feed, and he said to him, feed my lambs. Verse 16, look at this. And he said to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord. And it's the same wording, phileo, agape. Uh, yes, Lord, for you know I love you. And he said to him, tend my sheep. Look at this, verse 17. And he said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved. Come on, you know what came back to him. You know what came back to him? What are you trying to do, Lord? You trying to embarrass me? You trying to take me down? You're trying to say I'm not worthy? But look what happened. Peter was grieved but because of what he had said the third time. Do you love me? And then he said to him, Lord, you know all things. And you know, you know I love you. You know I love you. You know I love you. Say, well, Pastor Charlie, why was he having him say it three times? Can I ask you a question? How many times did Peter deny Christ? three times. Was Jesus needing to hear that Peter loved him? Or did Peter need to hear that he loved him? Y'all need to hear, hear this. You need, you need to hear this, man. See, Peter denied him three times publicly. Jesus wanted to break that word curse off over his life. He wanted to break that off and say, Peter, the last thing you have of me is not you've forsaken me. Or I don't know you. It's I know you. And I love you. He wanted Jesus, or I'm sorry, rather. Jesus wanted Peter to say it. I love you. Not just once, because he forsook him more than once. Not just twice, but three times. 
Because here's what happens. When you speak something out of your mouth, it goes straight down into your heart. Jesus was actually turning Peter's heart back to a place of healing and restoration by having him say, I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. He was actually allowing him to be healed on the inside. I love you. I love you, Jesus. He was healing him. See, there's a process that Jesus was using here. Jesus was having him return so he could be restored. But for him to be restored, he had to say it out of his mouth, I love you, Jesus. He had to take the bag of shame off and really say it out of his heart and out of his mouth that he loved Jesus. See, whenever we start wearing the bag of shame and we start feeling like we failed God or God failed us, the first thing that we do, the first thing that we do is speak out of our mouth, God, you failed me. Or God, I failed you. And all that does is continue the cycle of you failing God or feeling like you failed God. And you continually speak that over your life. And it's only until someone comes along and says, you can't speak that over your life anymore. If you love God with all you got, even if you missed it, Jesus is a restorer, number one. And he wants to restore you, but he's got to heal you to do it. And the only way he can heal you is if you will begin to say, okay, Lord, I love you. I love you, and I refuse to wear the bag of shame anymore. I refuse to wear the bag of shame anymore. See, too many people, they love God, but they don't get close to Jesus. Why don't they get close to Jesus? Because they feel like they failed. They feel like they failed. But when you realize Jesus already knows you failed, if you did, and his heart is not to condemn you, his heart is to restore you. His heart is to restore you so that you can receive the love that he has for you. Come on, y'all hearing me tonight? So no matter where you've been, no matter what your shame is, no matter what you've been through in life, no matter where your shame is, listen, if you're going to be a follower of Christ, you're going to have to know that Jesus is a restorer, not someone who tears you down. And not only is he a restorer, but all you have to do is confess your love for him and he will restore your heart and heal it on the inside. Heal it on the inside. He can't get to your heart. He can't heal you completely. But as soon as he can get to your heart, he can heal you completely. Y'all hear what I'm saying tonight? So remove the bag of shame. Maybe you missed it. Maybe you bombed it. Maybe you're sitting at Taco Bell crying and everybody's looking at you like, what a freak. Here's what you need to do. Quit hiding your face. Allow God to hear your, heal your heart and just say, Lord, I love you. Man, I love you, Jesus. I love you. And, and it's as simple as that. Say, man, that sounds way too simple. Okay, pay double tithe, go to church, all three services, serve in the nursery. Is that better? <laughs> no, God wants to heal your heart. God wants to heal your heart and restore it. All right? So if you're here tonight and you're carrying a bunch of bunch of baggage about you failed God or God failed you, man, I'm going to ask you to lay it down. Lay it down, cast it down, and just tell the Lord you love him, and I promise you he's going to restore your heart. It's as simple as that. I promise you.